Okay, so we're on. Are we ready? Ready. Yeah, same. Okay, okay we, we saw in part one of this talk that there are five phases in a disk system. And they depend on whether you have two feet on contact, in contact with the ground or one foot or no feet in contact with the ground. So we'll see these phases now very quickly. Uh, first, there's a double support in the back of the circle. That's followed by uh, a single support on the left foot. Then there's a very brief airborne phase. Then there's a single support on the right foot. And then finally, there will be a, a double support delivery phase where both feet will be in contact with the ground. Um, sometimes the athlete stays in contact with the ground during this whole period, but sometimes other times uh, the athlete will have only one foot in contact with the ground and sometimes they'll be off the ground completely at the time of discus release. Al momento del rilascio ci saranno delle situazioni in cui l'atleta avrà entrambi i piedi a contatto con il suolo, altre in cui solamente un piede sarà in contatto con il suolo, altre ancora in cui nessun piede sarà in contatto con il suolo. In this case, obviously, we have an athlete that is in contact with the ground with his right foot only at, re at release, and uh, the left foot is off the ground. And keep in mind that my graphics do not show the whole hand. So this is the instant of release. Ricordatevi che la mia grafica non mostra esattamente la mano. Si vede, non si vedono le dita, però questo è veramente l'istante del rilascio. So the hand does not show the fingers. It's like a fist like this. Does not show the fingers. Okay, in part one, I explained how... You, during um, during the initial double support in the back of the circle and the first part, the early part of the single support on the left foot, uh, the athlete produced um, a lot of angular momentum counterclockwise. And we're talking about angular momentum at this time, we're talking about angular momentum about a vertical axis. So it's like a view from overhead. So we left part one of the talk at the end of the single support phase on the left foot. So you went through double support, single support on the left foot, and then there's a takeoff. That's where we finished. And at that time, the, the athlete plus discus system had obtained almost all, not all, but almost all of the angular momentum that uh, the athlete was going to have during the throw. Not all of it, but most of it. And this angular momentum was stored mainly in the body of the thrower. Very little of it was in the discus. So at this point, uh, the athlete has two jobs to do. One thing the thrower has to do is to obtain a little bit more angular momentum in the final double support delivery phase. So about 90% of the total angular momentum is already, the athlete already has it. But later in the double support delivery phase, the athlete will obtain an additional roughly 10% more. The other job that the athlete has to do, the athlete has to transmit as much as possible of this angular momentum that is in the athlete's body has to be transmitted to the discus. And this is the final thing that the athlete will do before the discus release. So that will happen later in the throw. Right now, at this point, we'll go back to the end of the single support on the left foot, which is where we stop the analysis of the first talk. So the athlete is now off the ground, has, the left foot has left the ground, and the athlete has a lot of counterclockwise angular momentum. 
Now, in the airborne phase that follows, so this is stage number three, phase number three of the throw, um, in this airborne phase, the athlete uh, will not be able to get any more angular momentum. This is because it's impossible to do this. When you are off the ground, the loss of mechanics say that you cannot change your angular momentum. So we have seen uh, a double support at the back to the circle, single support on the left foot, and now airborne. And the next phase will be single support on the right foot. So then in the single support on the right foot, also there will be no angular momentum added or very little. This is possible according to the laws of mechanics, but simply it does not happen. The discus thrower will not gain hardly gain or lose almost any angular momentum uh, on the single support over the right foot. Okay, so in this uh, airborne phase, phase number three, and the single support on the right foot, phase number four, in these two phases, there's not going to be any or almost any change in the angular momentum. So is there anything you can do uh, for the throw in these two phases, or are they just useless phases? <laughs> so yes, there is something that we can, we can do about. There's something that we can do during this airborne in single support on the right foot. So we saw in part one that to get to generate angular momentum from the ground, to obtain angular momentum from the ground, you need to start from a position in which the upper body is very clockwise relative to the lower body. So, you know, you're starting your throw and you go like this, you go very clockwise. And at this time, the upper body is very clockwise relative to the lower body. But what has happened during the double support on the back of the circle and the single support on the left foot is that the upper body has almost caught up with the lower body. So why has this happened? Why has the hips, this is the hips, this is the shoulders, and you started very much this way, but now you're almost like this. Why did that happen? So the reason why the thrower did this is that by doing this action of the shoulders this way, by doing this action of the shoulders, that indirectly helps the muscles of the legs to be in slower concentric conditions and therefore to make bigger forces on the ground. And that was good because by making bigger forces with the muscles, it means that the feet will make bigger forces this way, clockwise on the ground. And by reaction, the ground will make bigger forces counterclockwise on the athlete and that helps to produce more angular momentum. So doing this, this catching up of the shoulders, catching up with the hips, that was a very good thing to do. But now we are going to be having a second uh, uh, generation of angular momentum in the final double support delivery phase. So here's the upper body, the lower body, here's the upper body, and you started here. Then in the double support, the back of the circle and the single support uh, over the left foot, the upper body rotates counterclockwise like this relative to the lower body. And But now we want to be in a very clockwise position of the lower body again later, so that now we need the upper body again to go clockwise relative to the lower body so that during this final double support delivery phase, you can again rotate counterclockwise, the upper body relative to the lower body. So we have two cycles of the same thing here. So you start like this and you go, this is the initial position, and then you go counterclockwise, clockwise and counterclockwise and release. Okay, so the athlete is just sticking off from the ground left foot just took off from the ground and the shoulders are caught up, almost caught up with the hips. 
And now you, we need to reestablish the extreme clockwise rotated position of the upper body relative to the lower body. And this will be done during the airborne phase and during the single support on the right foot. Okay, so let's see this in an animation. Three times. So what happened in this part that we saw, we saw there the combination of, this, of the airborne face plus the single support on the right foot. And in that period of time, the athlete went to be from being like this to being very clockwise rotated over the shoulders relative to the hips. And theoretically, you should have seen it in the animation, but you probably could not really see it. <laughs> okay, so this is the position of the athlete at the takeoff of the left foot. And this is a time when the shoulders have pretty much caught up with the hips, almost caught up. And then we have the airborne face, single support over the right foot. And then we have the landing of the left foot. So, so this will now um, um, start the double support delivery. Now, again, if you see these two figures, I am telling you that on the left side here, on, on this left side, uh, the shoulders are almost caught up with the hips. But here on the right side, uh, the shoulders are again very clockwise relative to the hips. But this is something that is difficult to see because these two views are perfectly view perfect view from above. Um, and what we needed to do is to look at the athlete aligned with the trunk. But in, in this view on the left, the, the, the trunk is not vertical. The trunk is, the head is farther to the left relative to the hips. And here on the right side, the head is down relative to the hips in the, in the picture. So it's like this, the trunk is like that. So what we want is a view that looks at the trunk aligned so that the top, the, the base of the neck and the hips are one behind the other one in a perfect view along the longitudinal axis of the trunk. So we need that view. And with a computer, we can do it. What you see here on the lower left is exactly the same time as on the picture directly above it. So at this time, we have a view perfectly along the trunk and I have rotated it so that the hips are facing up on your screen. So this, the, the red line is, so you have here, this is the left hip, this is the right hip, and they're perfectly horizontal in your image. I, it was my choice. Uh, and we see that the shoulders though, which are shown in this blue, not a very good <laughs> choice of color, it's not very visible, but the shoulders are a little bit clockwise relative to the hips, maybe 10, 15 degrees. So now we're going to see the the second picture, the, the, the landing of the left foot. We're going to do the same thing. So again, I have rotated, it's a view along the longitudinal axis, and I've rotated the picture so that the hips face upward again in, in, in the image. And what we see is that the shoulders are much more clockwise relative to the hips at this time. So this is that choice of color here, but you can see this angle here is very big, while this angle here was very small. Okay, uh, we can see this in a slightly different way. Um, I chose in this second picture to make the hips be facing exactly in the same direction as the picture on the left. But what I'm going to do now, and I don't know if you can see it. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> um, what I have done here in this last picture, this is the same, this picture here on the right is exactly the same as this picture in the middle. But I have rotated the picture on the right counterclockwise so that the shoulders, the shoulders are in the same direction as what they had here. And we see that when we do this, the hips are much more counterclockwise here relative to the shoulders than they were here.
the, uh, the these two images, the one on the right and the one in the middle, they show uh, the same thing. Uh, we're seeing that the shoulders are very clockwise relative to the hips, or that the hips are very counterclockwise relative to the shoulders. It's the same thing. So how did the athlete do this? Uh, the athlete did this with through two different mechanisms. One of them was that the athlete used the muscle. The, the one, the the first one is the one that you would logically think about intuitively. Is you use the muscles of the trunk, the oblique muscles of the trunk, to make the shoulders go clockwise relative to the hips. Okay, so the athlete has slowed down the counterclockwise rotation of the upper body, and uh, the athlete has therefore speeded up the counterclockwise rotation of the lower body. And this was done with the oblique muscles. But maybe, and we don't know if this second thing really happens, I am pretty sure it does, but I we're not sure. And that is that uh, the athlete, after taking off from, from uh, after taking off from the ground, the athlete brought, brought the two legs a little bit closer together. And this reduces the moment of inertia of the lower body, and it makes the lower part of the body rotate faster. Okay, so through these mechanisms, the athlete, which started like this and went this way, now the athlete is back to being very twisted like this at the time of landing of the left foot. So we're about to start the double support delivery phase, and we are in a good body position to be able to generate angular momentum again, a good clockwise uh, position of the shoulders so that you can generate uh, uh, counterclockwise angular momentum again. So let's see what happens in the double support delivery phase. In this phase, the athlete will make forces like this on the ground. And by reaction, the ground will make forces like this on the athlete. This force here that you see here is very important because that force is going to do two different jobs. Um, you'll remember that at the beginning of the throw, the athlete had no speed at all. The athlete just stopped about to start the throw. And uh, so that velocity at the start was zero meters per second. And during the double support uh, on the back of the circle and the single support on the left foot, that speed was changed into a forward speed across the throwing circle. Uh, you go from zero uh, to two, about 2.4 meters per second by the time that the left foot leaves the ground in the back of the circle. And why did we want this horizontal velocity? Well, we go back to the, the battleship example. So, it is useful for the center of mass of the athlete to be moving in the same direction as the throw because that adds to the speed of the projectile. So at takeoff of the left foot, you have 2.4 meters per second of forward velocity. Then in the air, that velocity does not change. That's loss of mechanics again. Then during the single support on the right foot, there can be some changes in speed, and there normally are some changes. So the athlete normally will lose a little bit of that uh, horizontal velocity. Okay, And now the athlete, uh, it's good to have these two meters per second of forward velocity. It's good for the ship to be traveling in the same direction as the cannon is going to shoot. But there's a possible problem because the athlete at some point has to stop this forward motion, because if not, he's going to step over the edge of the circle. And okay, so by the time that the discus is released, the speed will have gone still farther down. So the, the, the athlete has managed to slow down the speed of the body from two meters per second to 1.3 meters per second by the time of release, and ultimately that'll have to become zero meters per second, of course. So is the athlete moving forward during the acceleration of the discus? Uh, yes, uh, starts at like two meters per second, and then by release is going at 1.3 meters per second. 
So which of these speeds is the one that, that counts? <laughs> the, the, the good one, the important one. Uh, both are, is the average speed during this period and it's somewhere like 1.6, 1.7 meters per second, and that's good. So you wanted that. But remember, we need this force <laughs> to produce that slowing down because without this force, the athlete will go beyond the edge of the circle and make a foul. Okay, so this is with respect to translation. Now with respect to rotation, what is the importance of this force? Well, it's very important because this force <clears throat> this is the line of action of this force, more or less. <laughs> and you can see that this is an off-center force. And this is the, the moment arm of the force. So when you multiply this moment arm by the size of the force, you get a counterclockwise torque. So you will increase your angular momentum again in this final double support phase, mainly because of this force that you see here. This other force here made on the right foot, it will not have too much of an effect on the rotation for two reasons. One is the force is small, and the other one is because it passes very close to the center of mass. It has a very small moment arm. Okay, so our athlete is going to generate more angular momentum. Remember, we're talking only about that extra 10%. Um, but we want that to be 12, 13, 14. We want it to be as big as we can make it, but it's never going to be very big. So how can you maximize the torque that you get from the ground in the double support delivery phase? Well, you do it in exactly the same way as you did it in the first double support phase at the back of the circle. We have trick number one is you keep your arms spread out. By having the arms very spread out, your moment of inertia is very big. So even though you have a lot of angular momentum counterclockwise, you're not rotating very quickly. So your hips will have a counterclockwise rotation, but not very fast. And therefore the muscles of the legs will be in slower concentric conditions. And therefore they can make larger forces. So the feet can make bigger forces this way on the ground. And uh, by reaction, the ground will make larger forces this way on the feet. Okay, so keeping your arms spread out is a good way of increasing your angular momentum. The second trick is to actively throw your shoulders and the left arm counterclockwise. Okay, so and, and, the, and the reason for that is the same, right? It's you, you rotate your left arm and your shoulders counterclockwise which makes your lower body be rotating slower counterclockwise. So faster counterclockwise of the upper body means slower counterclockwise of the lower body. And again, this puts the leg muscles in slower concentric conditions. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this. So we're gonna see here the final double support delivery phase. We'll see it three times. And we're going to see that the left arm gets thrown counterclockwise very hard. And we will not see it very well, but the shoulders will rotate counterclockwise relative to the hips. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, so one question that you probably have right now is the following. Why is it that in the back of the circle, the thrower can generate uh, a large amount of angular momentum, but now in the final double support delivery, it can only produce about 10%. And the reason is the following. When you start the throw, you start initially in isometric conditions. The muscles are active, but there's no movement yet. And then as you progress in the double support, uh, in the initial double support phase and go into the uh, single support on the left foot, the muscles go from isometric to slow concentric to intermediate concentric and to fast concentric. So you have a mixture of uh, zero, uh, slow and fast speeds of shortening. 
So we have all of these conditions, but, and those are conditions that allow big forces. Well, in the very beginning, you can make big forces, then they become smaller, and then they become very small. But now when we look at the final double support delivery phase, um, you start already rotating very fast, and then you stay very fast. So the muscles are in fast concentric conditions during the whole period. So therefore, the forces you can make on the ground are small during the entire double support delivery. And um, so um, we're doing through technique by using the arms and the shoulders, you're helping the leg muscles to be in slower concentric conditions, but uh, it cannot produce a miracle. So you're gonna be, in, in the early part of the throw, the muscles are in slow, slow, intermediate, concentric conditions. In the final part of the throw, they'll be in fast concentric. So the forces will be smaller, the torques will be smaller, gain of angular momentum will be smaller. So um, yes, fast concentric conditions are unavoidable in the final oh. support delivery. That is why the angular momentum generated is small in the double support delivery phase. Nila. Okay, so we've talked about generation of angular momentum. Now we finish with that topic and we talk about um, the what we call, call the final, final stage of the throw. And that is the athlete needs to transmit as much angular momentum as possible from the body into the right arm and the discus. So how do you do that? Okay, well, you will use the, um, the pectoral muscle of the right arm. And by activating this muscle, you will increase the angular velocity of the right arm and the discus and you will reduce the angular the, the angular velocity of the rest of the body. So the uh, by using the right pectoral muscle, you're adding angular momentum to the right arm and discus and subtracting angular momentum from the rest of the body. So now we're going to look at some, some numbers to un understand an interesting concept. So we're going to see an example where the right arm has a speed of rotation of 1,000 degrees per second. This is pretty normal. It's, it's about what it is, more or less. Now let's imagine that while the arm has these 1,000 degrees per second of counterclockwise angular velocity, let's imagine if the rest of the body of the shoulders were static, if they were just facing forward and not rotating at all. That is not realistic. The, the trunk will be rotating counterclockwise. So let's no think. <laughs> okay, so in that case, at the shoulder joint, the shoulder joint will be horizontally adducting, AD adducting, at a speed of 1,000 degrees per second. That's a very large velocity, angular velocity. And so the muscle will have to shorten very quickly. Fast concentric, not good. <laughs> that The muscle is in fast concentric and therefore it cannot really make a very big force. Okay, so let's see now a slightly different situation. Again, in this new situation, the right arm will be rotating at 1000 degrees per second, but in this case, the trunk will be rotating counterclockwise at 200 degrees per second. So while the right arm rotates this way, the trunk rotates in the same direction, although much slower. And what that does is that means that the angular velocity at the joint, the articular angular velocity is now only 800 degrees per second. And this is good because it puts the muscle in slower concentric conditions. So even if the trunk does not pass all of its angular momentum to the right arm and the discus, it's useful for the trunk to have a counterclockwise angular velocity 
because it helps the right pectoral muscle to be in slower concentric conditions. Okay, so is there any other way that we can also help the right pectoral muscle? Yes. Remember that to produce angular momentum, the left arm was thrown counterclockwise very hard. Well, what we will do now is we will use the left pectoral muscle. And this muscle, what it will do is it will stop or slow down very much the counterclockwise motion of the left arm. So the arm is doing this and then you stop it or uh, maybe the speed of rotation of the left arm will stay the same, but the arm will be brought closer to the shoulder. So you can do this, or you can do this. Both of those actions require using the left pectoral muscle. And that produces a torque this way on the arm, Okay, to slow down the arm, you produce a clockwise torque on it, and it produces a counterclockwise torque on the trunk. So this speeds up the trunk and therefore puts the right pectoral muscle in slower concentric conditions. So what we have here is that the use of the left pectoral muscle is helping the use of the right pectoral muscle. Okay. So we, we've talked here about how um, uh, it's, it's athletes generate angular momentum about the vertical axis in the early part of the throw and they produce a lot of it. And then later on, that stays more or less constant with this small increase in the final double support phase. Okay, so um, I'm getting somebody new. Okay, so it's important. So it's important for the athletes to be very active in the early part of the throw, but we have to have a word of caution here. When you get this angular momentum, it's good to have the body very spread out, because that way the movement, uh, the the speed of rotation is slower. So big angular momentum, but not very big. Uh, speed of rotation. And this is something that um, can help the athlete to control what uh, is happening in the throw. So for uh, an elite athlete, the elite athlete has to go crazy in the first part of the throw. But a beginner maybe can should emphasize being a little bit slower and definitely very spread out, but slower first part of the throw, so in order to keep control. But as soon as that beginner gets more experience, then they have to really speed up. And I, I remember that when I wrote a paper about this, like 20 or 30 years ago, a coach uh, wrote an, another article say, no, that is not a good idea. Because uh, this coach, believe that you would lose too much control. But what I was trying uh, to say is not, I have a new revolutionary way of throwing the discus. No, that's not what I was trying to say. I was just explaining what throwers were already doing. All throwers do this. <laughs> yes, even the, one that's, the ones who feel they're very slow in the back part of the circle, they still are pretty fast. They will generate more angular momentum in the back of the circle than in the final double support delivery phase. Okay, so uh, up to here, we'll be talking about the generation of horizontal speed for the discus. And now we have to talk about the generation of vertical speed of the discus. Don't worry too much. It's a much shorter explanation. Okay, so... We have a speed of the discus at the at release. There's an upward vertical velocity. And we're viewing this from the back of the circle. So the discus will be moving up, but also away from us. And for this, we have to talk about a different component of angular momentum. You can see that a counterclockwise rotation in this view that helps to produce upward vertical speed for the discus. 
And this is called the Y component of angular momentum. And uh, the reason for that, until, until now, we've been talking about what is called the Z component of angular momentum. But now we're going to be talking about this Y angular momentum. So we have three axes to, to describe movement. The X axis will point towards the right, the Z axis points upward. And then there's a third axis, three dimensional, and that's not an X. Those are like the feathers of the arrow that's pointing into the screen. And this is the Y axis. So it's pointing in the direction of the throw. Okay, so, so angular momentum is uh, obtained by the thrower from the ground. The, the y angular momentum in the same way as the x angular as the z angular momentum before so this y angular momentum is obtained from, by the thrower from the ground and then near the end of the throw it's transferred from the thrower to the discus so this is the same as what we saw with the z component but the timing is different uh, the generation of y angular momentum happens at a later time in the throw than what we saw for the z angular momentum Okay, so we see the throw from this Y along this Y direction. And don't worry about the graphics on the upper left. There's a graphic is gotta be being produced. Don't worry about that. Just look at the thrower and we're gonna see it three times throwing away from us. Guardiamo il lanciatore che si muoverà per tre volte. Non vi preoccupate di quello che accade in alto a sinistra dello schermo. Okay, so we look now at the graphics. The graphics look at the Y angular momentum of the thrower, the discus, and thrower plus discus. So this, this graphic here, this one here, okay, the intermediate one is the thrower. This one down here is the discus. And this one up here is the sum of the two, is the total angular momentum. And we see that in the early part, there's some ups and downs. It goes, they all go up and then down and then up and then down again and then up again and then down again. And we're not going to worry about that. That's because as the thrower is making the throw, the thrower is leading right and left and right and left. We don't worry about it. We're going to start looking at what is happening at this time here. Okay, this is the single support on the left foot che è il momento del singolo appoggio of the left yes uh, no on the right on the, the right. right del piede destro a centro pedana okay so about halfway into it or two thirds of the way into that period uh, angular momentum is very low for all of them yeah you see that yes the, the thrower has some angular momentum this value here sorry the, the thrower has this angular momentum. The thrower really has about zero angular momentum. The discus has an angular momentum that is not zero, but is not very big. And uh, the combined sum is pretty much whatever the discus has. Right. So what do we see? Let's see what happens after this time. This is the important part. Is okay, so this is the beginning of this phase. And at this time we see what we were looking at right now. The disc, the, the thrower has about zero angular momentum. The discus has a little bit of positive angular momentum, which is counterclockwise. The the disc okay, the discus at this time is yeah. moving in this way. Okay. So relative to the center of mass, it has a little bit of counterclockwise angular momentum. Uh, and then what happens is this. Oops. Okay, so what happened there is that the angular momentum from starting at this instant here, the angular momentum of the thrower increases. 
it reaches this big value about halfway into the double support phase. And meanwhile, the angular momentum of the discus goes down a little bit, stays, it was near zero, it's still near zero. It goes yeah. to this value here. So the total angular momentum goes from a value here, not too far from zero, to this value here. All right, so the angular momentum of the whole system was roughly zero, and now it has a big counterclockwise value, about halfway or a third of the way into the double support phase. And then the, the angular momentum of the whole system pretty much stays constant. But meanwhile, the thrower loses angular momentum and the discus gains angular momentum. So there's a transfer of angular momentum. Okay, so we have two things here happening. We have an increase of the total angular momentum between this time and this time. And most of that angular momentum is going into the body of the thrower. And then the second stage during the double support phase there's the transmission of angular momentum from the thrower into the discus, even though the total does not change hardly at all. Okay, so let's see what happens in the late single support on the right foot. So right, we, we're looking here at the late single support and then the, the, the early part of the final double support delivery. So the athlete is gonna be making a force on the ground more or less in this direction. And by reaction, the athlete will receive a force like this, equal and opposite. And this force is off center relative to the center of mass. Well, this is produces a counterclockwise torque. Okay. And then in uh, double support, the early part of the double support, the, the right leg keeps doing the same thing. So it receives a force that points up and to the right. And this force, force is off center. And that produces, again, is this is same thing as before. It just produces a counterclockwise torque. Meanwhile, the left foot, which is now in contact with the ground, makes a force more or less like that on the ground and receives this force from the ground. And this force probably makes a clockwise torque about the center of mass. With the uh, methodology that we use, we cannot really measure these forces. When you have one foot in contact with the ground, we can figure out the force. But when there's two feet, we don't know which foot is doing what exactly. You, you would need what is called a force plate, which is basically it's a glorified bathroom scale. <laughs> and it would have, uh, you would need one scale on the right foot, one scale on the left foot. And that way you can distinguish which foot is doing what. But what we do know is that the net torque produced by these two forces is a net counterclockwise. We know that. There's going to be a counterclockwise torque made yes, through the right foot and a smaller clockwise torque through the left foot. So you have counterclockwise, a big one, and a small clockwise. The sum of the two is definitely counterclockwise. That we do know. Okay, so this is how you get your angular momentum. The last thing you need to do is you need to transfer angular momentum from the thrower to the discus. Why angular momentum? So we'll see this three times here. Quindi vediamo tre volte questa immagine in movimento. Okay, so what we just seen there, well, it's difficult to really just perceive, but you have seen the angular momentum of the thrower going down the angular momentum of the disc is going up and the total angular momentum staying about the same. So what is happening here is how are you doing this? How's the athlete doing this? Well, that is happening through the del deltoid muscle. So that muscle will be active and it, it, you, you have the pectoral muscle having this kind of emotion, this kind of emotion, through the pectoral action and from the deltoid, you have this motion. Okay, so we're pretty much finished. I'm just going to give you a very brief summary. Okay, the main goal of a discus throw is to give the largest possible amount of speed to the discus at release. 
there's a translation of the thrower forward and upward, and that makes a contribution to the speed of the discus. But most of the speed is produced through rotation. Angular momentum is obtained through the interaction of the feet with the ground. And this angular momentum is first stored in the body of the thrower. And just before release, very shortly before release, a large part of that angular momentum is transferred from the thrower to the discus. And this is done through the interaction of the thrower with the throwing arm and with the discus. So when we look at the discus, it's very important to keep these two separate concepts. One is interaction with the feet with the ground that produces angular momentum. And the other one is the interaction of the thrower with the throwing arm and the discus. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Uh, professor, we have to um, to examine more in detail the double phase delivery delivery phase. The what the oh the double support delivery yes. phase. Yes. Okay. Um, let me just give a very very brief uh, uh, talking about that. Uh, many coaches believe that uh, the thrower needs to keep both feet in contact with the ground all the way until after the discus is released. And this is a very European concept and uh, not everybody agrees with that. And this, this theory about why both feet should be in contact with the ground it was like around, let's say, 1970. It was, I, when I first heard about this concept, it sounded great. Yes, very good logic. It was very well thought out. Is Yes, you do need to be with two feet in contact with the ground at release. This is in the 1970s, and I believed it completely. But at that time, I did not have any data. Nobody had any data. And when I got the data, I changed my mind. So, uh, but the explanation for why, so my my final uh, feeling on feet in contact or feet off the ground is the following, is number one, it's not such an important thing. Yeah. You should not sleep, you should not lose too much sleep over thinking you have to be in contact with the ground or no, I have to be off the ground. Mm -hmm. It's possible that two feet in contact all the way to the end, yeah is a little bit better or a little bit worse. Um, my, my opinion right now with the information I have, I think that releasing the discus when you're off the ground is a little bit better. So, um, but the explanations for this, why I conclude that being off the ground is a little bit better uh, it's a very long explanation, uh, and it, we are it looking forward me... to hear it from you. <laughs> well, if I do it, I'll have to prepare slides. <laughs> not, not, tonight, not tonight. No, maybe. not tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> Next time, I'll professor. Not tonight. No. Next time. I'll, I will have Next to time we will, we'll get in detail. Next time. I'll have to look at a logic for how I have to explain it, and. Uh, because there's some very good thinking about why you should be with two feet in contact with the ground. There's very good logic for that. But yeah. so, next time, next, next time, time, maybe we'll have a, a, another time. I'll have maybe to be a, a, a supplementary lecture. Oh, for sure. Wait, 